Hello folks, welcome back to a new week on World War II TV. We're still in the Eastern Front, but today we're taking a slightly different uh, view of things. We're looking at German operations on the Eastern Front through the letters of four Panzer Generals, although focusing particularly on one of them that you, you've all heard of. David Starr returns to talk about this work, and it's an invaluable area and contribution and continuation of his work into this, into this theatre, but through a different kind of lens. His book, Hitler's Panzer Generals, Unguarded, is in the links below. You can buy it at your favourite bookshop or whatever, but I'm delighted to bring you in now. Um, good evening where you are, David. How are you today? Very well, mate. Very well. Nice to see everybody or hear from everybody. But uh, yeah, good to be back and talk about new project. So it's we were just talking before going live. There's a lot to unpack here, lots of questions. We will bring up a PowerPoint in a minute. But I think most of us watching kind of think you as kind of the, the operational level, studying the campaigns, lots of use of archives and military documents, which, of course, the process then is, you know, how accurate are they? What might be missing? Who wrote that up? When? What were they trying to say? And for whom? And then you've gone into this, the same kind of operation to looking at the same campaign, but now through these letters. So before we start off, just how did the idea came about for this? And, and what different approach did you take to, to looking at the letters? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I would have said I will never, ever write again on operations on the Eastern Front in uh, uh, in 1941 because I figured that I had um, kind of exhausted the topic, exactly as you say, I all this operational stuff. And I just sort of felt like... Um, you know, uh, if you've really done your homework, there's, 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 you know, multiple books and so on. I, I feel like I've, I've, I've satisfied that that desire to want to know a lot of things, and maybe that's a, a good lead into then why, why, why these letters, and and maybe the, the the really critical question people could say is, if you've done your homework, Doctor Stahl, how come you didn't use the letters for the original books? Um, mm, good point. And, and it's a it's a it's a. Am I on, on screen? I'm seeing. I'm, I've got to move over. There we go. Um, uh, the so it is a good question and when i went if i go back to when i first went to the german military archive i was just ordering everything because i wanted to look at it all um and i was definitely planning to write an operational account looking in that book at the first sort of two months i was going to look at army group center which is guderian so uh you know one of our key people and the person i'm going to talk about a little bit in the, the opening sort of uh, presentation Here's the thing, though, and this might surprise a few people, and we'll get into it when I, when I show the, the slide presentation. Um, the Germans didn't write with the same, or at least they wrote with the same alphabet, but they didn't form the letters in the same way that they form them today. That sounds extraordinary to people, but it's actually true. Why is that the case? So if you imagine Germany going back, you know, to the sort of even late medieval period, is this huge collection it's the holy roman empire but it's not really an empire it's all these duchies principalities all these different political entities that eventually get amalgamated into the states and even after 1871 it's still four different states really because they have mm. different archives and different armies and different education systems but the reality is they haven't yet had a federalized system to go through the school networks of all these areas and make sure that everybody forms letters in the same way so they didn't that means the German generals went through these uh, school systems as young boys, forming letters whenever their local town and school tells them how to form them. And don't think that that's just a variant on the G or something with a little lip or something. They are like hieroglyphics. Some of them don't bear any resemblance to anything you've ever seen before. So I had two issues. When I first opened these letters, I sat there and thought, I can't really read this. It didn't take me too long to re realize that even other Germans, uh, you know, native speakers, I'm not a native speaker, uh, in spite of my name, I they, they couldn't read them either. And that's when I sort of discovered this. And a lot of them said, oh, and people might, if they know this, might be saying, oh, that's the Zitterlin, David. It's not Zitterlin. That comes in the early 20th century when the Prussian state, and only the Prussian state, all of our German generals, I think without exception, um, are Prussians. Um, uh, they enact this reform and then they are... Um, uh, learning, uh, you know, at least there's a there's a there's a, a uniformity within Prussia. But even the Zitterlin has different letters. Some of them are the ones you recognise, others not. That's only half the story. Uh, I mean, I still could have spent as a graduate student a ton of money, got these things transcribed because I wasn't going to be able to do it. 
uh, and then had access to them. But the other thing in my mind was the uh, something called the Ordinance on Communication. Some people might already know about that, but basically there's a, a very strict regulation in the in the German army that dictates what you're allowed to put in a, in a letter as a soldier. Now, right. if you soldier and you're not allowed to say where you are you're not allowed to say who you're commanding of you're not allowed to name anybody by name not allowed, it's all these different things not allowed to mention any any propaganda not allowed to talk about the, the campaign not even your opinion of it now with all those regulations my supposition it later proved to be quite incorrect as we'll discover today tonight um or today is as it may be in europe um the supposition was, okay, so if the soldiers can't write about anything, I could spend all this money and expense transcribing these letters, and then at the end I'm just going to find out about Auntie Bessie's varicose veins. What else could they be writing about? So it's all going to be for nothing. And besides, this is another supposition on my part, all these secondary accounts that I'd read, these are things from the 70s and 80s, they largely had nothing in them. Then No one ever else seemed to look at them. And the idea was, oh, all these historians have done their homework, even though at the same time I was concluding, gosh, they haven't looked at lots of things that I'm finding in this archive. The exception to that would be Kenneth Maxey, who did do a biography of Guderian in the 1970s. He had had access to the letters. I got them from the archive. At that stage, they weren't there. He'd gone through uh, the Guderian family and got them. Uh, but he only uses them intermittently. He only has the odd little phrase here and the and my idea was, okay, he's picked the eyes out of this. I can use that too. I don't have to transcribe, you know, dozens of pages in order to get the same thing that he basically ended up with. So there's the odd reference in my first book to the Kenneth Maxey for, you know, a, a, a part out of there. One thing I can say also on that is, and it's, it's, it's another, you know, if there's graduate students watching, turns out the Kenneth Maxey either didn't get a good translation or didn't have very good German because the things that I've gone back to have thought wow that's not even sometimes not even close to correct so um you know viewing everything in the original does make a lot of sense but that was the basic starting point and when I many years later uh fortunately with more research money through my university and so on I finally was there and and it was just on on a whim I just saw them and thought oh I could get those transcribed. I'd love yeah. to know what's there, expecting there not to be much, but a little bit wiser, I thought, oh, but what are the chances there There might be really go real gold in these? You know, there's, there's, I think for 1941, Guderian's got something like uh, 32 or 33 letters. I thought, what are the chances there could be something really useful? So I got them uh, transcribed. Long story short, they were much more than I'd hoped. I was quite shocked when I read them of just how much operational detail there was. And I knew others had them. I knew Herpen had some. I knew that uh, uh, um, Reinhardt had them. I just thought next time I'm there, I'm getting them all. And then when I sat there, I just thought, this is, there's so much in this. And maybe again, we'll get into this tonight. It's not just the operational, the military. It's a lot of things besides that. And I thought, this is actually worth, it was harder and harder to sort of say, oh, I'll just leave all this because I'm done with 1941 or I'm done with Eastern Front commanders. And eventually I just thought, no, i gotta, I got to do something with it all. So here we are. Well, that's a brilliant opening uh, uh, start there. And we were talking before going live. You know, I think everybody watching this, both watching it live now and who'll be watching it later on, they th they'll they know something about Guderian. They'll, 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 Give him a label of, you know, Panzer genius or communications expert or whatever it would be, or they associate Blitzkrieg with him, whatever. I didn't know the name of his wife. Um, I couldn't have pulled that out of anything in a pub quiz or something. And yet, there's always a, a, a someone else behind the behind the person. There's 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 always that um, driving force or influential force back there, um, and it brings up the dynamics of, you know, their relationship as a husband and wife, and then there's there there's fathers and their, their sons they've got parents as well so you know let's bring uh let's bring um the, the wives in because um and and we can we can use that you know your second slide is about the handwriting there because this is one of uh, marguerite's letters isn't it indeed yep so that's uh yeah perfect um that's 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 this idea this current shrift is this sort of you know it says it up there but this old style writing and i guess it's it's part of that leading into you know where did all this come from and, and why is it so interesting um uh, you know, it's both that story I just told then, but, uh, you know, as you allude to, it, it was in the private papers of Guderian, um, and I don't have any recollection of sort of 15 years ago when I first started looking in that, yeah, at least that long ago, a lot more even, um, that I don't have any memory then of seeing Margaretas, but that may also have just been, hey, I'm not here to write about Margareta, I'm not interested, yeah. I'm interested in, yeah. in, 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 her, in her husband. 
And when I was getting all of this stuff very much now focused on doing a book, I, I think that the starting point, uh, and again, you and I were sort of talking about this before, but it's what I put to the audience is, I suspect exactly as you say, a lot of people know Guderian. If they say, oh, which campaigns was he in? They could tell you what he did. We know that stuff. No one's interested in a book that sort of rehashes the, oh, guess what? Guderian was running this campaign and doing these things. That stuff's not interesting. You, you, I think people want the value add. What else? What else do we know about these guys? And in a sense, I'd say this book in a nutshell is we know Guderian, the man in a uniform. Who's the who's the rest of the guy? Like, who yeah. is he in that private space? And what's great about Guderian, and actually, Paul, if I can say, you know, you were sharing some really great little anecdotes there about um, Manfred um, uh, Rommel and some of the stuff that you remember from hearing him speak about his um, uh, his mother and and how she engaged with her father. Um, in a sense, I, it, it's very humanizing because it's really only closest family and partners and so on who know you that well to call you out yeah. on your nonsense. Yeah. And in a sense, we've got pages. I mean, not only 13 letters from Margareta, but it shows two things, not just who did Guderian marry, but what really surprised me, uh, and keep in mind in a book that I really focused on four German generals, she's the only one for whom I could get any letters, and I'll go you one better. I asked everyone who I know who works in the field about anything at all, anywhere published on German generals' wives. To this day, I have all of nothing. So mm. we know nothing. People always say, oh, World War II, hasn't it all been done? And I'm always sitting there thinking, gosh, on the inside, it feels like there's so much to do. But I could find nothing of context. And a lot of stuff has been done on women in the Third Reich, and I sort of accessed some of that. But it's tendentially interesting because these ladies are also separate in a lot of ways. Yeah. And again, as we go through this, um, you'll get a bit of a sense of just exactly uh, what that is and why even people who are sitting here watching and say, oh, I just like campaigns and battles, David. I'm not so sure about all of this. Just, just, just hold your judgment because you might be surprised in the way I was surprised. In fact, in some ways, this this thing has four people on it. It should have five, right? Because she's a bigger part of the book than I ever planned. Um, okay, so I can see you've moved on. So let's yep. let's let's sort of um, go to that. Basically, what I've done there with the top two quotations is presented. Uh, this is coming from Margaret's um, uh, letters. Uh, who she is. And in the top one there, it says, I dare not allow myself to think too much about the events of the war. Above all, uh, not about the infinitely great tasks you are repeatedly given to solve in the war zone. That conforms to what everybody who writes about women in the Third Reich basically think. That's exactly what she seems to be. Uh, the dutiful housewife who wouldn't presume to tell the great general how to do anything. That didn't surprise me at all. Uh, it fits very much. But what it actually is doing is sort of setting up how complex she is as a woman because in the next slide we're going to discover that's not who she is at all. She is she is presenting the woman that in some ways I think I, I don't claim to know their relationship this well. It may be to some extent that every now and then Guderian needs to be reminded, oh, no, she is a conventional wife because, you know, she. It, this is the 1940s, right? And, and, and they're not young in the 1940s. So they're a different age. They have different ideas. But that is definitely, categorically, not who Margareta is. And also, that's also not who Guderian wants her to be. Later on, at another point, uh, just a second little quotation there, she says, um, uh, at one point, she explicitly describes her support for Heinz as being the purpose and aim of my vocation as a woman. This conforms exactly to that Nazi stereotype. Who is the woman? The woman is the person who raises kids and keeps the home. Thank that, you very much. That sounds to me like something if someone from the propaganda office came to her door and said, and wanted a sound bite, and they were going around to all these generals' wives and colonels' wives, and that's that would be the, the towing the party line, saying what exactly what you do to, you know, we, we haven't talked about it much on this channel, but this whole idea you had said it yourself that the the women folk the ch are there to support in a very traditional and old, you know, at the stove baking, just sending messages of love and and woolly socks to the front and things like that, and yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting. I, I think it's it's also because I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, you know, my the, the night I sat down. I remember very well the night I first read Guderian's letters, just because it wasn't what I was expecting at all. And I got I had this moment of like, oh god, I spent all this time doing this stuff. I should have fifteen years ago been ordering these letters. In any case, in some ways, I'm very glad I didn't. By the way, that was an initial thought, but then I realised um, the 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 first thing was oh the operations. You know, that's mm -hmm. the stuff I've really 
But I realized more and more, this book became much more, as I said, the man and more than just one man. It was becoming a, a sort of a, a multiple biography book. Um, and there was so much scope to talk about these men that would never have fit in those earlier books. Sure, the odd passage here and there would have been great, but uh, this book was not the same and it, and it deserves its own. Cracking on, um, and this is, I think, where we begin to see the transition. So the second photo on there, as it says on the, the, on the, on the, on the, on the little description, that's Heinz Gunter Guderian. That's their eldest son. Now, a little bit of context on him. He is, you know, you can see it there. He's a lieutenant in 1941. He's actually serving on the Eastern Front. He's serving in a panzer division. He will go on to have quite a good career in the Second World War, but he is definitely most famous for the fact that after the war, he joins the Bundeswehr and he becomes Inspector of Panzertruppe for the Panzer uh, for the for the Bundeswehr, which is exactly the same job Guderian gets in 1943. So they actually have the same job. He must have had that quite that pedigree in the in the Bundeswehr as well, with the name Guderian, and that's his father and, and all the rest of it. The interesting thing is. This is the guy who's helping Kenneth Maxey in the 1970s write his biography. And that's quite an interesting book because it's kind of written in this very conversational style. Like there's a lot of things in there I would say I don't really agree with, but leave that aside. I'm always interested in what's what, where the gold is. At one point, he's just talking to Kenneth Maxey and Kenneth Maxey seems to just write this stuff down almost as though he's, he's had the conversation. And he's saying, yeah, um, uh, Heinz Gunther, uh, you know, kind of even for the 1970s, it must have sounded a bit strange, was oddly complimentary about his mother, um, saying that she was absolutely essential to his father's success, performing as a kind of private chief of staff. Now, I don't think a general in the Bundeswehr, a man who was a young man in the Second World War, frivolously uses terms like uh, a chief of staff for his mother? That's just, mm. that's a very high, very specialized, you need a lot of training, you don't just put anyone into the gym. That is a, a, a high uh, quality position. And this is how he describes his mother. And if we move to the next slide, I think we begin to see why, why is she so exciting? So I'll read directly from a letter from the 23rd of December, 1941. Keep in mind, the context here is Braukitsch, who is the guy there next to Hitler. Uh, he's the uh, commander in chief of the uh, of the German army, right? So he's extremely you know, he's the top of the pile, really. In reality, everybody who knows anything about Brokich knows he's a bit of a he's actually very much a weak character. That's in many ways why he was picked for that role. The fact is, though, he has just been dismissed. And this is what Margrethe, uh, Margrethe writes in the very next letter she writes to Heinz. The Christmas surprise with von Brokic getting his marching orders caused quite a stir. There are rumours circulating about seven other generals. I'll pause right there. She knows what's going on. Now, what's happening there? She lives in Berlin. She lives in the same suburb as Himmler. This is the exclusive suburb, right? You can't get in there. It's too expensive. And this is where they all hobnob and they meet and they discuss. And the, gen the general's wife, she talks about Keitel, uh, yeah, Keitel's wife, Kesselring's wife, numerous others' names dropped. And there's only 13 letters that we've got, right? But we know she's operating in that milieu, right? Mm. She is not just going there for coffee and cake. She is going there to get information to strategize, and she's passing on this information. So she knows there are apparently seven other, she is gathering information. So these are the rumors. If they are true, events will have taken a turn that we feared. She is clearly discussing this stuff with him. Mm. I don't want to go into any more detail in writing, but you will understand what I mean. On the telephone recently, I also didn't want to ask. We can go into, uh, we can speak in more depth later. Why does she not want to do it on the telephone? Telephones are not what they are today. They are not secure at all. Uh, not just because people think that the Gestapo might be listening, but actually what happens in the staff is you pick up the receiver and it's actually totally normal that others would do the same because people are taking notes and people are listening in and you just have to put the headset on. And so you can hear. Now she's strategizing here. Uh, she doesn't want to be overheard. Two reasons. One, that's they're talking about how they're going to try and manipulate their way or you know politic their way into the highest position second of all this is absolutely not what a wife is supposed to be. i mean who's advising who here right who's running the show what he doesn't go of that generation men did not go to their wives theoretically to get advice on their careers right now the blue part that i put in highlight there so she doesn't want to talk about it on the phone but this is what she then writes there will also be changes and consequences for your activities and tasks. 
she is going to tell him. This is Heinz Gunther saying, yeah, my mother acted as a bit of a chief of, uh, chief of staff to my father. She was absolutely essential to him. She's coming up with stuff and telling him what you will do. Your activities and tasks will change. I am not just the lady who sits here and makes dinner for you. I'm not just the lady, as you said, knitting socks. I am thinking, I am in control of information. And my friend, you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. And she is categorical about it. Um, I hope that with all my heart that it will turn out for the best. You know how profoundly I experience and share everything with you. That for me, for someone who has just told us, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to go into detail and I kind of can't. At the same time, there are, there are things that are going to have to change and you're going to have to do things. We need to have a conversation. I know stuff and you need to know it. That's incredibly revealing. And what do you consider? To me, it implies before he's gone off, they've had some kind of where are we? What's the German nation doing? Where's my career going? How is it going to affect you and I? Uh, they, they've, they, they've, you know, they've not just, you know, waved handkerchiefs at the station. They, they've clearly gone through some kind of process of, of, of trying to predict where things are going to go and how they, as a couple, uh, and in, her, as you say, her, she as his chief of staff, come promotional manager, whatever you want to call, a, a kind of absolutely. Is, working this out it's absolutely insightful fantastic stuff i was going to say that I, I was shocked too when i'm reading this sort of thing um the other thing is and and we won't really uh, it's probably getting beyond this i don't want to just talk about Margareta all the time but uh you know everyone will know that shortly thereafter three days later in fact guderian's fired and he is fired not just because kluger at the commander of army group center says oh that's it i can't deal with this guy and he's recalcitrant not following orders and all the rest of it which is all true but Hitler is also, it's very clear, Hitler is complicit in this. Kluger goes to him and Hitler is absolutely, this guy is clearly retreating against orders. He's not a fan, right? Of course Hitler's mm. not a fan of this. Now, if you think about that, Hitler has dismissed Guderian in some degree of disgrace and he's not coming back. Through 1942, Guderian is a civilian basically again. In fact, yeah. at one point, I can't remember where I got this from, he's in a barber's chair and he apparently confi confides in the barber's chair, yeah, it's very embarrassing for me to be who I am because everyone, every real man in Germany is off fighting and here I am getting my hair cut. You know, it's, what am I doing? Um, and, you know, uh, Guderian therefore wants back in it just so happens that it's through Margareta, again, it's a it's a kind of a long story, but it's it's family connections. She is she is connected to Budwin Keitel, so that's the brother of Wilhelm Keitel. He is the most important guy, he's in Hitler's stuff. Budwin Keitel is his brother, he's also a general, he's in the personnel umt. So that like the, the department that basically decides who gets what appointment. And good and, and Margareta is uh, I don't know who maybe it's her sister or someone is married to him or something. I can't remember the exact connection. Um, uh, and, and therefore is politicking with him, setting up hunting um, uh, meetings with Bourbon Keitel and Guderian. And then what happens in early 1943? Guderian's back in, Inspector General of Panzer Troops. And, and it is no small amount of working those connections to get him back into the good graces. And ultimately, Guderian will go on in 1944 to become the acting uh, chief yeah. of the Army General Staff. So really important guy, but wins back that trust. Um, and, you know, I don't have the, the documents, but then a lot of this stuff is just relationships to point to, oh, it was Magreta, but it's clearly Magreta setting up those those meetings. It's clearly Magreta who's got the the in. It just so happens that uh, Bruder Keitel has these that has this authority. Um, in other words, your point is correct. And maybe just to, to go to that final thing there, it says at the bottom, this is just a different study, looking at high society in the Third Reich, but it does talk about the wives in this high society. It says, the actions of the wives of male members of this inner sanctum should not be overlooked. In many cases, they were surprisingly well-informed and used their own celebrity to work in favor uh, of their husbands and friends. Um, exactly what we see Margareta doing. So very consistent mm. in that way. Yeah. So um, this part here is uh, a little bit different. So if we've just established he's certainly instrumental in this way that probably none of us would have thought, you know, they, and to what extent are other wives behaving in this? I can't believe most of them are. In fact, some of those German generals, because I was looking at others, it's quite clear that they, they talk to their wives in sometimes dismissive terms by our standards today. I don't know what right. was normal for the times, but at one point, I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, Eva Reinhardt, so that's 
uh, 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 Georg Hans Reinhardt's uh, wife, she writes to him clearly concerned that he's visiting the front a lot. And she's, you know, she's worried about him. And she says something, we don't have her letters, but she's clearly said something to that effect of, hey, I'm worried about you going up to the front like that. He writes back a letter that's, hey, don't you presume to tell me where I should be spending my time. I have to be seen at the front and I don't really want to hear from you. But one of the other things I thought when I thought about that letter for a while was maybe part of his rebuke is, yeah, asserting his sort of male dominance and, hey, you're stepping into the military space, don't you know that's not your space? But maybe if all that we just heard about Margareta is correct, if these ladies are politicking on their behalf, they might be quite concerned that when they're representing them, that they don't represent them as as uh, as the as the correct kind. You don't want this overly, I'm putting this all in quotation marks so nobody has a go at me, but overly emotional woman getting upset about things like, you know, me being at the front and presuming to tell, you've got to be the right kind of uh, advocate for me. You've got to you've got to talk the right talk. You can't be this. Maybe that's what's going on there. But really interesting stuff. In any case, um, the other side to this, uh, you know, value of people like the, the, the wives is the fact that they do serve a really important role in just that emotional support. One thing we should not underestimate. It's absolutely crystal clear in Guderian's letters. If you look at Guderian's letters from the early part of Barbarossa through to the end of 1941, he gets progressively quite depressed. I think it's safe to say, I'm not a psychologist, but I think it's safe to say from reading the letters, quite clinically depressed. Um, there's all different things I can say about that. Well, I can't remember what's in the later slides, so I might leave that at that point. But clearly in all of this, just like wives the world over, they are uh, uh, a source of real solace and a bit of a reminder of the world before this war, right? Um, but she also serves in that role, um, you know, uh, you know, the whole confluence of Heimat und Front. You know, that's one of these ideas in German propaganda. But yeah. she picks that stuff up and she serves in that. So what does she say there? Um, with, the great, with, with the greatest sympathy, we are thinking of you in terrible wintry Russia and we are grateful and ashamed that we are permitted to have nice, warm, well-kept home here. I mean, they do live in a lovely home, right? And they, they you know, she doesn't wait in the bread line. She's got servants. She has money. She, she does very well. But then she knows what the language is. You know, we should be ashamed almost of having all this because we are, should be on the front with you. You know, we should be experiencing the hardships. Um the next part, and this is maybe my little final part on, 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 on just trying to unpack how does their family work and maybe particularly who, who Margareta is, is, is a little bit of context. There's two sons that they have. Both of them are on the Eastern Front. Um, um, Heinz Gunther is in Army Group South in a Panzer Division. Kurt Guderian is Army Group North. So they're all in different areas. Army Group North, Guderian's in the center, and the other one's in the south. Kurt is... Um, uh, he's not in a panzer division from what I remember, but he's clearly in a very difficult position. They've had no letters from him for, for weeks, weeks on end, and Margareta is writing to, ha to Heinz, and basically she's nervous, right? What's happened to him? And then all of a sudden a letter turns up from Kurt, but it's addressed to Heinz Gunther, his brother, and he sent it home to his mother, basically concluding, I think the letter would get to him faster if it first goes home and then out again because lateral communications on the Eastern Front apparently aren't much of a thing, right? So she's got this letter suddenly, having not heard from him in weeks. She says to Heinz in the, le in, in, in the letter that we have this, oh, I accidentally opened it. I don't believe that for a second. I bet you she <laughs> tore it open wanting to know. And look, it's very possible that Kurt writes something different. Maybe there's a bit more bravado to his brother than he might have written to his wife. But this is what we get from Kurt, right? And, and it's important in its own right, but it's important also for what she's going to do with this in a second. So just let me read this. Uh, we had occupied a strategically important village to our right and our and left. There were uh, there were open hollows of 10 kilometers in woodlands all around, in some places right up to the outermost houses. Here we were subjected to several days of fantastic barrage and air and air raids. Honestly, some of the stuff you can't read, right? I, I had two um, uh, handwriting experts transcribed it. So I got it once done, and then I took it from this very expensive person uh, to another person to pay again to just check it all, and even them, they couldn't make it out sometimes. Mm -hmm. So there is illegible things in there. So tank assaults, 
uh, et cetera. Completely surrounded, three days without food, low on ammunition, vehicle shot to pieces, we were finally thrown out. One third losses, 50% of my motorcycle platoon, 30% in the scout platoon, you can read the rest. What he's saying is, this is extremely dangerous. I mean, you can just have a look at, and people probably know this also from some of my work, uh, how high officer casualties are, right? Now, what's super interesting here, and the reason why I'm doing all of this, Margareta includes this. We don't actually have Kurt's letter. She wrote this down verbatim in a letter that she's writing to Heinz, and she's basically including it to say, look what he's up to. What's super, super interesting, really interesting for me, but it's not on the slide, is that the next paragraph transitions into, oh, and Heinz, I can't remember the name, Auntie so-and-so is here. Oh, she's been doing way too much. Oh my gosh. You know, she's been so busy. She takes on way too much. Oh, and then I took her to the train station and what luck, we got a, a window seat. And what I could not reconcile at that point was, now it's very possible, maybe she wrote this letter at different times, right? Maybe this was the part where she's copying down this but it was this ability for a mother and a and a wife with all her loved ones on the Eastern Front with tremendous losses. And he's just written it down, one third losses, to just transition into the from the exceptional to the utterly mundane. Mm. Um and, and just flow. Now, to what extent this I don't have an answer to this, to what extent is that? Yeah, that's, that's, there's the National Socialist woman, because she's also a good party member of multiple National Socialist organizations, to what extent is that just the headspace you get into? And to what expen extent is that, I don't know what we might call it, performing resilience? You know, I, I know my role. Don't get overly emotional. Here, I'll copy it all down for you. Take a big, deep breath and now just move on and talk about Auntie Bessie or whatever. Um, but I find that super interesting in terms of who are these people and to what extent is Guderian also that guy? Because I'll tell you something about Guderian. He doesn't write to his kids. He doesn't, you know, he wrote about six weeks into the campaign. I, I'm doing this from memory. He writes to Margareta and says, hey, can you send me the field post number of the boys? And the only reason he did it is because Kurt sent him a telegram saying, actually, it must have been four weeks in because it was four weeks in that he gets the uh, the oak leaves to the Knight's Cross. And he sends him a telegram. And then Guderian writes to Margareta and says, oh, I don't have the boys field post numbers. Can you send them? Now, I don't know how many weeks he'd been in the East before Barbarossa begins, but he's clearly been there for four weeks. His boys are directly exposed. He must himself, because he writes about going to these hospitals and giving out the awards and seeing how much carnage is taking place. He's never thought at this point, until this point, to write his boys a letter, and he doesn't seem to do it very much. In fact, most of his letters conclude with any news on the boys. He doesn't seem to be getting very much, which maybe people could say, oh, that's a reflection of a man of the age, you know, they don't worry about these things or whatever. I'm not so sure, because Herpener, who's also in this book, that's uh, the Panzer IV commander, he has a son on the Eastern Front, and he is doing exactly the opposite. He is constantly making a nuisance of himself by ringing up the 6th Army, keep in mind he's an Army Group North, and 6th Army is an Army Group South, going through the chains of command to try and find out how a lowly lieutenant is doing, and believe me, they are not impressed. Um, he's always saying, oh, they, they, they always get annoyed. There are no friends in this war. Uh, in fact, he even goes through the OKH on occasion, says they're sick of me calling. Would you mind just inquiring about, they must have hated it, but it's the opposite reaction of Guderian. So I'm not sure how much that's just men of that age. He was absolutely, uh, in fact, he's pulling all strings to get him off the Eastern Front. I hope there's um, some psychiatrists and psychologists watching this who can kind of do some Pap diagnoses of these and just kind of work out what might be going on. I know it's impossible to do, but it, the insight is amazing. Just a quick question. A couple yeah. of people asked about, you, you You talked about, you know, you're not supposed to write certain things, but an example from Gwilym is censorship at Guderian's level. So as a, as a, at their rank, are they supposed to self-censor or do they still have to be go through some kind of class system? How does it work? And for letters going back to them, are they censored in Germany before they get to the front? Are they censored? What, what, what do you know about the process? Sure. So there, you're absolutely right. There is censorship for all letters, not at that level. I suspect the reason is, um, well, I, maybe it's a, a degree of trust because I don't imagine they're at all supposed to be writing about the operational stuff. And, and more than that, they're writing about personalities and getting very upset about other members of the command and so on. But maybe the idea would be at that level, you can't have low, who's doing this? Lowly lieutenants reading all this high level material. That could be a security risk in itself. Yeah. So it's, it's um, I, I believe it's at the division or core level, can't remember, where they are, there's 
you know, it's not a huge number of people. In fact, the chances of your letter being read, when you consider there are billions of letters being sent in, I know that sounds crazy, but I think someone estimated it was 40 billion are sent in the course of the Second World War in Germany. I don't quite know how they get to these figures, but uh, it's clearly a lot, right? Um, and uh, I, I read somewhere, I don't remember where, that it's something like 13, or at least in one of these examples, there was 13 people. And even then, that then gets cannibalized because there's not enough people for you know, other officers and things. It's only officers doing it. So they pull them out because they need officers. Um, so your chances of actually having your letter read are minuscule. Um, but that's not what's happening to these guys, partly because they're not subject to it. But the other thing is I was very interested in how are they sending these letters? Almost all of the letters they ever send it's not 100% true, but it's almost all. Uh, simply, I mean, they're in a command, right? And there's always a Luftwaffe liaison and there's an airfield nearby and they're just handing it to the next person who's going back to Berlin and they take it with them. Then they get to Berlin and one of two things happen. They've got a stamp, but it's just a local stamp and it goes through the local Berlin to get there next day. Or they take the car to wherever they're going, go go past uh, Margrethe's house, because it's in Berlin, mm. and deliver it. Uh, to her hand. Sometimes these guys even go in for tea and 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 relate some stories. Kind of bypassing official channels to some extent. Absolutely, yeah. but more and it's more much faster. Speed rather than necessarily because they're saying things are insensitive. It's more because they know it. If they if they give it to a trusted, you know, loyal driver, lo lieutenant, pilot, whatever, there's more chance of it getting it through than just entrusting it to the the system that could take weeks. Could take weeks, indeed, yep. Um, and the other thing is, as soon as that person turns up at the door, she can hand whatever she's got, and he'll be back there two days later or yeah. in the next day, and the letters move very quickly. That also means that there's sometimes a really fast dialogue between the two. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a whole other side to... Uh, to, you know, if we were to... Going off on a bit of a, 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 um, a sidetrack here, but... You know, if we ask the question, what is the veracity of these letters? Um, so how much can we trust these letters? Um, one of the things that occurred to me when I was trying to establish that, because in theory you can't, right? I, I once met Guderian's grandson. This is going back 20 years ago. And I had asked him at that time. I knew enough to know, hey, there's all these letters. Have you ever read them? Do you know anything about them? And I had no concept of ever doing a book on it. Um, and he said to me, he had no idea. He had zero idea that any letters existed. He was quite fascinated to know that. So um, the family don't know anything. They were, and when, when I asked at the archive, what, what information do you have about these letters, right? They've just turned up. What, what, what do you know about them? Is this the full collection? They don't know anything either. Um, but here's what I was able to kind of do to try and work out, is this a complete collection? And I think um, it's categorically the case that uh, well, I don't know if it's categorically, but it's extremely likely this is not the full collection. Here's why. I said before we had something like 32, 33 letters. I can't remember exactly what it is. I mean, I've counted them up, but I can't remember. I just divided that by the number of, sorry, that's the number of letters I've got. I've got more through the Second World War, but these are the ones that I'm particularly interested in. Why? Because I'm doing four Panzer commanders and all of these guys are directly comparable because they're all Panzer Group commanders on the Eastern Front in 1941. That means they're directly comparable. Anyone doing studies of the German generals, you're comparing apples with oranges because they're different commands, different levels, different periods of the war that they're serving in. I mean, there's some value in that, but I, I've, this is what also drove me to this book, is I have their private letters. There's only six guys in 1941 who were Panzer Group commanders. So Kleist and, 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 and Hort, I don't have any letters for, right? But the other four I do, so it's really comparable. Um, anyway, so I'm, I basically made a calculation. If they've written X number of letters over a six-month period, then theoretically... You could assume it's one letter, you know, make it make a quick uh, division there. It turns out it's every, I think it was every uh, 4.5 days, or maybe 5.5 days that a letter should be turning up. What have I also got? I've got the dates of the letters. Because then I just plotted them all and realized there's huge gaps. At one point, the longest one in 1941 is, Guderian doesn't write to Margareta for five weeks. Now, you would think if he doesn't write for five weeks, the letter after five weeks would say something like, my dear, I've been so incredibly busy fighting yeah. the Battle of Kiev. Not a word. Not a word. 
Um, there's no explanation. He just rolls on to the next thing. The other thing is because I've got my curtains, I started looking a bit more closely at hers. And at one point she says, just in passing, oh, thank you very much for your letter of the 17th. So I quickly went back through and looked at all Guderian's letters. There is not a single one. I can't remember what the day it was. Maybe it's the 16th or 15th before, who knows? Um, but there was no letter throughout the entire series that came on that date, which means, and this is why I was thinking of it, that 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 source of communication means letters didn't most likely get lost. If you're handing it to a lieutenant, it's a it's a pretty low level lieutenant. If he loses the general's letter, right? Mm. He's putting it in his pocket and he's taking it directly to her house, right? So he's not going to lose it. Unlike the postal system, which can definitely lose letters, right? Or for all kinds of reasons, the Eastern Front's not secure. Partisans, I mean, not that many of them in 1941, but still, it's a fought process putting your letters in that system. Uh, they're clearly getting them, they're clearly getting home. In fact, we know from that Margreta letter, they're getting home and yet they're not in the collection. What does that suggest to us? It suggests to us that after the war, Guderian went through these letters and decided, oh, that one's not going to do well for posterity. I think I might get rid of that one, uh, is my supposition. Or maybe they just got lost. But there's no little kids running around the Guderian home. I don't think that's as likely. Uh, there could be all kinds of reasons about what's being put in these letters that may not in the post-war world uh, want to be something that they know. We can I mean, talk about that Because, you know, obviously social media is what we, our generation are using, but often I will I will look back on something I said even on Facebook and think, well, I was in a weird mood that day. <laughs> what was I thinking? And then I'll think, oh, I might just delete that now. It is, it's out of date. And I, I guess back then the same thing would apply with letters. You know, you're talking about these, these panda generals being under high stress um with days that went well campaigns that went better uh, optimistic days uh, very negative days pressure around them and people being sacked and dismissed and killed around them all the time and so you can imagine that after the war they're looking yeah that god what was i thinking then you know what was i was i Maybe I was ridiculously confident that day. Maybe I was ridiculously negative that day. Maybe I kind of inadvertently dropped a friend in it who I didn't really want to drop in it. It's what what's all missing is could be more interesting than what's all that what's there although what's there is clearly interesting as well i agree and maybe the, the next one is keep in mind for all those good reasons that you just mentioned that could also account for it right there could be reasons why you read that and you cringe but there could also be an, and 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 i think this is even likely i mean people are free to disagree because there's no there's no evidence either way but what are the chances and this is something guderian i mean anyone who's read my stuff on guderian uh, uh, I'm very critical of the man, not just critical because of, you know, his association with National Socialism, because let's be honest, he's a, he's complicit in criminality. Yeah, There's absolutely. no question about that. But even if you just said, what about as a general, though, David, put all that to the side, right? Yeah, there's a lot to criticize as well, right? And I, and I, and I, and, I, and that's going through his files in not just even his personal files, but the military files in great depth. There's a lot to critique on the man. And indeed, the, the generals writ large. Um, but the other thing you could say, and, and, and I would say about Guderian, that makes him not just good at what he does, but brilliant. So, you know, cards on the table, let's be very, very fair-minded here, is he understands the world he lives in, I would say, better than his contemporaries, and he has a record to prove it. Keep in mind, this is a guy who had a successful career in the Kaiserreich. This is a guy who had a successful career in the Weimar Republic. This is a guy who has a very successful career in National Socialism. And then what happens? American captivity, we have records of his interrogation. Oh, suddenly he's a non-Nazi. He had Christmas 1944 at whose house? Himmler's. Because he was building his career at that point. He knows who to schmooze, and it's a very small private affair. And he knows who to go with. He's getting, he's made a career of himself because he works it. And even when he gets fired, he can work his way in and the way very few can and go straight up the chain, right? Right to the highest levels. And then after the war, who is he? Oh, that's Guderian, you know, the, the Panzer genius, you know, the guy who invented Blitzkrieg, basically. He sells himself to Little Hard, who buys it all. He sells himself to an American public who buy it all. Guderian, until only 20 years, ago was you know exemplary and kenneth maxey in the 70s are quite a few of these guys who wrote those early biographies hook line and sinker oh he was amazing he was amazing well only a guy who's quite the genius at reinventing himself so coming back to what letters don't survive oh my god what if he's written about hitler what if he's written about what's the big thing going on on the eastern front and that five-week period is exactly when that happens yeah mass murder of the jews 
he stopped his letters stop end of or beginning of mm. August, I think, right through to the first week. And that's when that real uptake in the killing takes place. Also an army group center and right behind Panzer Group 2. Now I don't know. Maybe he doesn't write to his wife about something so apparent. But given that we know there's anti-Semitism in the family, right? Because we have got records on that. Maybe he did write about it. Maybe he said just an innocuous comment like the Jews are getting what they deserve or something. Mm. Oh, my God, he would have seen it. That doesn't age well. That letter's got to go. I don't know, but there's a very strong possibility he might have written about, you know, things are happening in the East here that will reshape the future of the country and uh, yep. great and good and Himmler's directing them. God knows what. Um, yep. Maybe you and the family can come out and live here and now we've got rid of the locals. You know? <laughs> yeah, all kinds of things that just he would have gotten in the 1940s. Ah, that's not going to help my new career. Um, That's really fascinating. And then we'll move to the next slide because when you sent me these slides and I looked at that one, I've made an immediate judgment about her with that list of things she's part of. Um, and and yet there's there's other sides. This is why you you know you said yourself she is clearly part of the system, part of the mechanism, and a member of all these associations. But you know, but, but yeah, but you put this for a reason. So so explain. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, we can do dispense with this one quickly. It's got all her party memberships up there. I mean, in some ways, is this because she's a true believer? Like everything I just said might suggest she is. At the same time, if these people are, and they are, very strategic. I mean, look, she only joins in 1938. The Nazis have been around for a while then, and Guderian yeah. was a believer a long time. But I think they start to realise, hey, highest ranks, are we going to have to be... Sign up to everything, National Socialist uh, People's Welfare, the, the the Women's League, the party itself, we're hook, line, sinker in here. On the flip side, we get letters from her where she writes things like, you know, this is just a private letter. And, and keep in mind, they're living in an age before they would have known. This is one big point for the veracity of these letters. Unlike an American general who serves in Afghanistan, who's writing private letters to his wife, he, I think we could reasonably assume in this day and age, he probably writes that with the idea, hey, one day a historian's likely to look at this. This is not going to sit in a family drawer for the rest of time. Someone's going to see this. In fact, they're probably writing with that in mind. I think that's different in the 1940s. I don't think they're necessarily thinking, my private letters are one day going to be read by people because this is a private letter. Um, uh, and at that stage, others, other generals from previous campaigns, they didn't know, there was no publications of their private letters. That was private. Uh, but she writes when the, uh, just after obviously Pearl Harbor and so on, the first successes of the Japanese are fantastic and will inflict great pain on the English and Americans. Uh, what I'm trying to just say with this, people can read it for themselves, but when she writes things like that, you know, one of the big themes in this women's study of the Third Reich is, are, are they bystanders? Are they just the yeah. homemakers? Or are they complicit? And I always think people like, I mean, she's different from an average wife because she's in the circles of power. So she's clearly not an everyday person. She's accessing a lot more information. But when she's got the chance, I wish, you know, inflict great pain on the English and the Americans. She's no bystander. She's both feet in and she, she's wishing the axe as well. So, yeah, we can probably move on. But, you know. It, it is fascinating that that... that that she wrote that and it survives and yeah this is i like a show that raises more questions than, than answers them they're they're always yeah. um, one food for thought but um anyway back to you i was gonna say maybe some graduate student out there or some future historian you know can go to the next step and find i mean I'm by, I'm by no means have i exhausted every um naklas so the the private papers maybe there's a whole bunch more of these and you could put this stuff together and come up with a much more complex picture of who these women are and just how important they are to their husbands but yeah. you know to transition to guderian a bit more um you know i've just copied out a few things there people might say oh David, that's a bit sensual yeah, what are you going with all this you know um but there's two things there. Um, I did a, a previous book about German general, oh, sorry, German generals. It's called Soldiers of Barbarossa. I'm not trying to pitch books here, but I just did it with Craig Luther, and we were both fascinated in getting a book out that's a whole bunch of really uh, interesting field posts from everyday German soldiers experiencing Barbarossa. Basically, it's a book of source material. But the one thing I got out of that was, you know, obviously we read hundreds and hundreds of letters, and I just have over the time I've done these operational studies. This language is exceptional. They don't write like this. This is extremely sensual for the time, right? What it tells us, though, is Guderian is two things. And it's not true of all those German generals when I read their letters. He is extremely devoted to his wife, a very loving man, and is not afraid to express that in the letters. But it also underscores how important he doesn't even write to his kids. He doesn't have very good relationships with other generals, right? How important Margareta. She is the one person in his life he definitely confides in and who he has unreserved love for. Um, and that's some of the other guys. In fact, Schmidt is one of them, one of the other Panzer generals. He doesn't write 
anything like this to his wife. And maybe it's because, you know, it's a different age, but honestly, he doesn't seem to like her very much. Um, I can only say that because I have some letters to Polis, right, who's one of the other German generals. Yeah. He writes he writes long letters to Polis, and he's sometimes saying very private things in these letters, like, oh, it's very difficult, and I don't know what to do, and blah, 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 blah. Polis, you know, you, uh, we struggle here. Then he writes to his wife, you get matter of fact. Um, it's quite extraordinary. I won't go into all the details. But um, then the second part there on that slide Um it's clear, though, that Guderian, you might say, oh, he's in the, he's in the, the command and he's a, he's, a, he's a bit of a god figure for some of these, certainly the younger officers. But what he says at one point, and this is why it's so revealing, and as I say, keep in mind, this is him, he gets quite depressed as the campaign goes on. It's obviously not going well, but he's also feeling it emotionally. Uh, you can imagine uh, how, how pleased I am that you empathize so fervently with me despite the long separation and that I have this one possibility to unburden my heart to another human being that is infinitely valuable and liberating because as an older person, I am ever more isolated and the young people increasingly keep their distance. So he is, he is a, 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 you know, um, I think he does struggle for relationships and, uh, you know, I think the other thing that keeps him off the Eastern Front after he's been fired is he is a bit of an emotional wreck. For some months, he he's, he's kind of closed up. We have almost no record of anything he says or does. He comes off the Eastern Front. In fact, I've got a bit of a theory that his insubordination, flagrant insubordination, which some people would say, oh, yeah, that's Guderian. Don't you know? He's, he's like that. Yeah, he's like that in July of 1941. He's like that in the French campaign but it's a different form of insubordination. This was always going to get him fired. And I have a bit of a theory, he wanted he, he wanted out. He it, You cannot ask to be relieved. Um, numerous generals refer to that. And all, uh, the ones who will try and get off will talk about health problems. And it's almost always what they talk about. Guderian did have health problems, very real health problems actually, uh, on the Eastern Front as part of the book that deals with all of their health problems. But, um, but he is gunning for this, and uh, he, he is so he, he is retreating further than he needs to uh, at the time. And he's the big bulk Panzer commander, and he is blowing past each individual point where even his his subordinates think we don't have to go further. We've actually caught up with some supplies, and he keeps doing it. Makes me kind of wonder why does he do that? And and maybe he is he's, he's so emotionally. Um, broken that he's he's trying to get off the eastern front in any case um but, you know, that just a, that's fascinating because i tend to think that the most successful quote unquote german leaders of, of various ranks are the ones that are totally committed to the cause they just go all in family life personal life is secondary if not even not existing at all they're committed and and that's i think max hastings wrote about that years ago that was the difference between the allied soldier and the axis soldiers the allied soldier really did want to just be in a pub with his mates and go back home and and and, and do that kind of stuff and 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 Guderian, the fact he's talking in such a, I mean, for the time and his age, that's pretty racy um, language he's using. So he's, he has still got one foot firmly back in his relationship with his wife and as a family man and as a, uh, and yet he's still also dictating the campaigns. It's, it's a, or wants to be, or, or doesn't want to be, but is in a position where he can be. It's, it's a real fascinating 100%. insight. I agree. I agree. It's also, if this is why it's so good about doing these kind of targeted individual studies, because otherwise we're left with the big tropes, you know, oh, the German generals are also committed and they're very yeah. much Eastern Front, all this kind of stuff. It's not even just Guderian's letters. Like there's um, uh, a diary of a gentleman, I'm forgetting the details, I think two or three years ago that I finished the book, but um, who goes to see Guderian in early July 1941. He's in the Luftwaffe um, and he basically says, I, I, I myself am just so shattered by the way everything. I keep in mind, the winter's beginning, the campaign, the offensive campaign is ground to a halt. And he said, I went to Guderian expecting Guderian of all people, the great panzer general would pump me up, right? I, I discovered a man more broken than me. Guderian is nur ein Gummilöwe, is only a rubber lion. In other words, he's basically saying, yeah, that this Guderian is a broken man. It's not at all who I thought. And instead of him pumping me, I, I spent the whole evening trying to cheer him up. Um, it's very clear. But I think that's also, in fairness to Guderian, when, when I won't go into it, but when you look at their daily routine, how long those hours are, you know, one of the jobs these guys all refer to is, you know, having to go into the hospitals and give out the medals. And they see 
you know, devastation. And they're going along the battlefields. You see these photos, you know, people have probably seen them. It's pretty horrific. It's the it's the gruesomeness of war, right? In fact, actually, you don't really see those photos. It's interesting what what you can't even sometimes publish in books. Some of the photos you can find occasionally, you know, are these people half burned out of tanks and all the rest of it. And I've had people say, oh, you don't put that in the book. Why are you putting that in the book? No, 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 that's a bit too much, right? But you kind of realize, in, you know, this is the reality of what these guys would have seen. And, you know, uh, you know, for all that we talk about PTSD, of course, they didn't talk in those terms. They didn't know what that sort of stuff is. But it's clearly something, it's not a new con concept that no one ever suffered before this. It's just there wasn't the language for it yeah. and there wasn't the scope to talk about it. In fact, Hoopener at one point says uh, something in one of his letters about, oh, my nightmares post-World War I are all coming back to me. I'm having trouble sleeping or something along those lines. And, uh, you know, it's very revealing. You know, these guys were frontline guys. Well, Guderian less so, actually, but Herpener was definitely a frontline guy. Uh, he was down in the tunnels with tunnels collapsing on him and all the rest of it in the First World War. Of course, he's having nightmares about stuff like that. That must have been extremely confronting and traumatic. And he's starting to discover in Barbarossa it's coming back. Well, we'll move on and talk about it because, again, that that last go moving back on that slide there, I'm getting, I'm I'm empathetic towards Guderian now. I'm sympathetic. He seems almost like a a likable figure now but then when you move on you realize like everybody else, as you said earlier he is absolutely culpable and it's and 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 we can we can identify and have some empathy for people anybody going through trauma and ptsd and yet at the same time as we've talked about on this channel you've written about there's this increasing normalization of violence and terrible violence and atrocities there that's kind of going in parallel and these paradoxically some of these figures have the same things i'm thinking of um Diekman, uh, for, responsible for Orador Serglan here in France, sort of writing lovely letters to his kids and stuff, and then going off and murdering 600 French people the next day. Yeah, that that strange, par yeah, as I said, yeah. paradoxical way they can balance these two two aspects of, oh, it's, you know, I miss you so much, sweetheart. The front is really depressing, and yet going out and murdering. So, so Guderian is, he, as we said, we must make it clear if anyone's watching this, he is absolutely part of the, part of the evil regime, isn't he? Indeed, and 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 he and he's uh, kind of calculating about that too, because for all that he would have known, and we now have this categorical evidence that I've basically put up there on that slide. There's a guy in Germany who did amazing work going back now ten years ago. Uh, he wrote a book um, on the Commissar Order, basically, which people probably know about. It's where they they kill all the the commissars that they encounter. And before Felix Rumer wrote that book, it had always been these targeted little studies. Someone did a study of this division and came up with whatever they came up with. This is a guy who basically went into the German archive and said, I'm just going to read it all. He spent, I think, two years there. Back in the day, the German archive used to be open from eight to six. And that was periods when I used to go there when I first started to encounter it. And Felix was just always there. And he was just read all day long, every day. Keep in mind, this is a warehouse filled, of, filled with paper, right? And his idea was, I'm just going to read it all. And then I'm going to categorically engage with this question of how much evidence is there. Now, Guderian post-war, he knows his role. He's writing a book that's going to be a bestseller and he's going to invent himself. And he can invent himself from scratch because there are no files, right? No one's got any access to them. It's over to him to write his script. He's going to be the first. This is this is great for him, right? So he becomes the great Panzer general. And of course, when it comes to the the, the Commissar order, uh, he, 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 he heard about it, but he absolutely didn't refuse. He refused to pass it on because the good name of the German army, yada, yada, yada. And he's done with it. But of course, Felix Roma is looking at all this sort of stuff. I'll put it up there. But, um, you know, we have categorical evidence, not just of a couple being killed. Um, you know, uh, what has it got there? 196 between June and October. Um, in fact, the, the, the Panzer Corps were um, disproportionately representative in the killing over and above infantry corps and infantry corps are more numerous, of course. Um, it also says to the fact that the Einsatzgruppen are operating at the very front of the Eastern Front. Who's at the very front of the Eastern Front? The Panzer Groups. Mm. Um, but it just means this idea that they don't know what's going on and they're not involved in all this killing because that's somewhere behind the front. No, it's absolutely these guys because where do they get their bullets from? Where do they get their fuel from? They get it through the supply chain of the Panzer Groups. Um, so they know what's going on. They're complicit in it. And things like the Commissar Order are absolutely being passed on. So, you know, Guderian's just that 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 guy. Again, it speaks to both things. It speaks to how cold-blooded these guys can be, although he would have said, 
well, how am I different from anyone else? I'm just part of the, the cultural milieu. How many of the 150 German divisional commanders rejected the orders? How many of the 44 corps commanders on the Eastern Front rejected the orders? How many of the four panzer group commanders or the 13 army commanders or the three army? None of them. So he's normal for his time. But after the war, he suddenly realizes, just like almost all the others, hey, this doesn't make me age well. But that also speaks to being very aware of He's very politically aware. He's not a diehard Nazi in that sense. He's now reinvented himself almost from the first day of captivity. You know, it's amazing to read his, his in interrogation files and things. It's, it's, he, he seems to know, oh, these are the other guys. We're back to liberal democracy, are we? I've got that language, mm. you know. And mm. Hitler, what, what a terrible guy. All those terrible things he did. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, that, those types scare me more in some ways than the unrepentant ones. The ones that go yeah. to the gallows still, you know, fervently backing the Fuhrer, I kind of have a, not respect for, but at least they at least they were loyal to their wicked ideologies. But the ones who just, no, no, it wasn't me. No, 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 not at all. No, I was, that they, they, they disgust me more in some ways. Well, we've got a couple of, we have time for a couple of questions there. Go ahead, um, mate. And I, my first one is going to be, we talked, you talked about, the fact that of the four you wrote about, some did express things to their wives and some didn't. But across the, the, the letters of these four generals, was there any things that were common to all four? Did all four of them show, for example, as the, as that campaign went from going quite well to, to going less well, did, did that come across in all the letters? Was there, was there anything that kind of was a, a constant? Yes, uh, lots of different things that are constant. Because I was, that's, that's a really good question for what, what is the virtue of studying for? And when I said before, oh, you know, they're all directly comparable. What do I mean by that? My hope is, yes, we now know if someone reads that book, they know a lot more about these. Oh, hang on, my phone's just gone. One second. Um, no worries. There we go. Um, uh, what do we know about those guys? Yeah, we now know a lot about them. My hope is that the book might be bigger than the sum of its parts. It might tell us something about the cultural conditioning of the Panzer Trooper, right? And, and that's exactly your question. Where do we see the, the, the similarities? So, you know, if Guderian was a really good guy for reinventing himself to his audience, uh, sorry, he, he's a really good guy because he knows how to, to achieve success, whichever regime he's in, but we're particularly interested in the National Socialist regime, he gets that you have got to promote yourself publicly. How does he be successful? We might like to answer that question as, uh, I don't know, you win battles? No, 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 not in his view at all. No, it's all about being famous. I mean, if you think about it, that's, that's Rommel as well. Rommel yeah. is famous, right? And he's in those newsreels and he's in the illustrated magazines. And if you look at, I, I got into kids' magazines for the Third Reich because what I was so interested in is the fact that, oh, I'm getting, well, it's I'll actually my, around, David. no, it's my birthday today is the thing. So oh, happy getting, birthday. Thank, thank you, mate. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wasn't going to mention that, but it's, the family's now all calling me. Uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, the so if, if they're if they're if they're understanding what success is, and again, Guderian's got a nose for this stuff. He knows I've got to get into these um, these these th this media world. All the Panzer groups have um, propaganda companies, so they're called propaganda companies attached to them. Armies have that. Panzer groups have that. Below that court, don't have them. So that means. Um, men like Herbener have them, Guderian has them, Schmidt and Reinhardt are core commanders at the beginning of Barbarossa, they only become Panzer Group commanders later on. Guderian uses this super effectively. He is in them, he brings them to everything. Some of the other commanders, army commanders now, are like, I don't know what those guys are doing, there's nothing to do with me, have them take their photos wherever. The Panzer Trooper guys are much more aware. They are gunning for this. They are looking for every possibility to be in the newsreels. They're writing about it in the letters as well. So keep an eye out for the illustrated magazines. Tell me when I'm in them. They're, they're, they're aware there's a relationship between notoriety and career success. Another real uh, innovation, I think, is um, uh, uh, autographs. So these guys manage massive amounts of fan mail while they're on the Eastern Front. And uh, Guderian, who's probably, again, one of the most innovative, he comes up with something that others copy, such as I can work out timelines for who had this stuff first. He comes up with postcards, which he prints himself, and it's got his signature printed on the front, right? It's actually, I use one of the, I stuck it in the book as a photo so people can see it, right? 
And, you know, it's in, in this commanding sort of pose. And, and, and what he does is when people, and a lot of them are kids, are writing to him, he sits there and writes about it. Now, the reason I know he's doing this is because he sometimes complains about it to Mark Rutte. He's like, oh, God, the man, I've got so much correspondence to get through. But think about that. What's he doing on the Eastern Front? We think he's fighting this great campaign. In the night, he's sitting there. I got to manage all my correspondence. I got to write to the 12 year olds. You know, I got to sign the cards, chuck them in. But there's huge numbers of them, right? Huge numbers of these. And again, if you look at the, the kids' magazines, there's something called Der Pimpf, which is basically the boy, or that doesn't really translate very well, but it's clearly for Hitler youth kids. They're all pursuing um, uh, the, the German generals because they put these things in there and they're all going for autographs. In fact, in Schmidt's private papers, I found a 10 year old boy's letter and he's telling him it's so good because he's telling him all kinds of things. He's telling him, oh, I've got this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Will you please sign something and send it to me? Right now. The other thing is these generals, there's four ranks of general. I can't remember what Schmidt is. I think he's a, a general of Panzertruppe. The kid knows what he is. Now, Schmidt yeah. at that time is a corps commander. There are 44 corps commanders. Who the hell knows about Schmidt? Who cares about Schmidt? It's like football cards for the age, right? Yeah. Oh, i got to get that guy. I'm going to get him. I'll write my letter and get him. But the kid knows what his exact rank is. He doesn't just use the generic general. He doesn't call him field marshal. He doesn't call him colonel general. He doesn't call him lieutenant general. General of Panzertruppe. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the memoirs of the time talked about we used to outdo each other on who knew more military detail. They're not footballers who the kids are following. It's such a yeah. militarized state. But what's interesting is on the other end, the German generals are entertaining this. They're absolutely going in for, well, I now respond to this. I don't feel like, oh, who cares about these kids? Again, it's all this managing of the message, and that's consistent with all of these guys, not so much for the infantry commanders such as I could see. But as I started to look, part of my research, believe it or not, went to Nazi memorabilia stores online. So it's a bit oh, of a murky world well to get into. To step into there. <laughs> Mate, I was a little bit careful. I was asking a few questions as well because I wanted to find out how far down does this go? How many postcards can I find? I found them for every one of the major Panzer Group commanders. I found them for all the senior generals that anyone on this show could probably name. And then I started getting down into some of the divisional commanders and I was still finding postcards. So these guys are going to printers, having them printed up because they're getting requests, probably not as many, but they're clearly getting them to the point where, oh, that's the thing you do. They're also therefore learning from each other. Oh, you get these cards made up, don't you know? And then you can, oh, it's efficient. Oh, and I got a photo of myself. That's good. I'll be advertised on their on their bedroom are walls. You wearing your hat? Are you, how many metal ribbons are you wearing in your photo? Yeah. But, yeah. but this, this is fascinating, David, because often we talk about the the influence of people like hitler on these commanders and, and yeah if you're in the eastern front how much day-to-day -day stuff are you actually hearing from, from hitler but if you're saying that night after night they're sitting with all these 12 year old boys telling them how fantastic they are that's going to affect your own self-belief it's gonna it's, it's as you said it's going to distract you from the actual campaign you're trying to wage you know when you should be studying troop dispositions and things that like you're actually just signing autographs but also it could easily lead to an inflated um opinion of yourself because these kids are telling you oh my god you're fantastic what you're doing so it's it's it adds Maybe. this other level of insight into the decision making they're making which is as we start this conversation ultimately what we're always trying to do is is why yeah. did general x do this on that day and go for that bridge when maybe he didn't have the artillery to, to, to support it, whatever it be. We can maybe see there are these links to, yeah, but he signed 500 autographs over the previous two days. He was completely overly confident that day. It's it's fascinating. It could also be exactly that. Uh, but as you get further into the campaign and you're realizing I'm more and more depressed, I need more and more. That's where I want to spend my time. Oh, I have another letter of some child telling yeah. me how wonderful I am. I mean, all kinds of different shades of gray on these guys. But I, I think you're right. I think what we, I think a lot of the audience are probably going down this path too, because people have said to me, oh, this is all your woke history, David, doing your, your German women and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, what? What does that even mean? I'm beyond just figuring out which tank went where on what day. Yeah, yeah. It's much more interesting to know you, exactly your point, Paul. What are they doing in the evenings? I'd always kind of assumed... I guess they're running the campaign, it's 24-7. But there's other things. I know that Guderian was, um, at one point, he's writing in the letters about, uh, he's perusing art magazines because he's a, he's, a, he's a bit of an art buyer. He likes, he likes to get low-level, high-grade art, and he spends a lot of money on it because, of course, they get bribe money from Hitler. He's got a lot of money to spend. He spends, at one point, like 300 marks, I think it is, on an art piece. That would be like a... That would be a worker's half yearly salary or something. Oh. I, I Don't quote me on those exact numbers, but it's some huge amount, right? Herpener, at one point, he buys illegally, because you're not supposed to do it without ration cards, he buys something like 
you know, 250 marks worth of uh, sparkling wine. And he has to say, oh, don't, don't, don't let anyone know that we're actually doing this. This is all private, right? So when you write the check, just, you know, it's, this is not really supposed to happen. Um, so, you know, so these guys, are, it's just interesting again, because like they're spending their time, you kind of imagine they're 24 seven generals. Clearly they're not. Clearly they're also spending time, well, buying things for their wine cellars and, you know. Well, the, the, and this is, I mean, we, we will leave it there and just bring you back in the future. But, but Al Murray said to me, you know, podcaster and comedian that because he's a stage comedian he understands that that he had there's a private al and there's a stage al and there's kind of a podcast interview al and these generals have the same thing there's the there's the writing to the wife when you're not a general you're just heinz then there's the going out and speaking in front of the troops general where you're projecting sometimes an image of confidence then there's the oh shit it's all going tits up general when you're sitting in your tent late at night and contemplating how many soviet divisions are bearing down you and 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 for us as historians understanding when they're switching hats metaphorically is key to understanding the decisions they're making i understand that we you know we want to put them in this single category you know so I, I hate this whole pattern is good montgomery is terrible binary way of looking at it It'll, they're complex the nuanced individuals um in the case of Guderian, who 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 straddles numerous eras in his career uh, of uh, and and yet survives as you made the point survives through them all to by 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 willpower and and reading and and, and bending with the breeze i suppose um it's it's, it's a great way to put it right? yeah i agree it's exactly it's exactly why when i was reading those letters i you know as a, as a final point i kind of sat there and thought i can't put these down i i have to do something with this there's just too many connections and stuff but i i agree i think we're and I think a lot of the audience are at that point too. I don't think a lot of people are these days, you know, I wonder where Guderian was. Yeah, there's a million books on that. If you want to know where he served, you can read those. And yep. But I think there's a now a bit of a thirst for, yeah, these are complex human beings and, and we're getting more of that complexity. So great. Well, I'm going to let you get back to your birthday cake. And um, and folks, <laughs> we're continuing this conversation in some ways with David Harrisfield on uh, Wednesday where we're looking oh, at brilliant. just how Nazi was the average German soldier with the spoiler alert being it's complicated. But that's something he's been studying recently. So thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I will see you all again later in the week. It's been a fantastic opener to this this Eastern Front section. So we say enjoy your birthday. I'll see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys.